Thank you for listening to Scandinavian Crimes Podcast. Be sure to check out the episode links and be part of our other social media platforms where you can leave a topic suggestion or even share some of your insights regarding the subject matter of the episode. We will always do our best to provide a well-researched episode, but sometimes due to limited access to information and translation issues, some information can be lost. It is therefore good to do your own research and get a deeper understanding of a case of your own interest. So with that all said, let us start today's episode. Welcome to Scandinavian Crimes. My name is Devante and say hello to my lovely co-host, Delilah. Hi. And on this podcast, we will cover famous Scandinavian criminals who made their mark throughout Scandinavian history. So today we have some updates regarding the Banaham murders and Viggo Christensen and his acquittal. Now, I want to lay this to rest because already there has been a few of you who have brought it to our attention that, yes, he was acquitted for the crime. He was proven innocent. And uh, yeah, it's about time we just lay this whole situation to rest. So we're going to do exactly that today. We're going to go over some details, um, reiterate some things that we mentioned before, but also bring some new information to light. So that way we can kind of be on the same page about where he stands today in terms of how the public views him in terms of his acquittal and just going forward, how the police kind of held information from the public and how a lot of it had to do with the outcome of the previous trial. So let's kind of just jump right into it. So in February 2021, after several unsuccessful attempts to reopen the case, including two appeals, Viggo Christensen's plea for a reopening was approved by the Criminal Cases Review Commission. The decision was reached with a split vote of 3-2 with the commission's chairperson, Siv Hallgren, dissenting. Now, as a result, the case was transferred to the jurisdiction of Oslo's Office of Public Prosecutor, who then assigned it to the Oslo Police District for further investigation. Uh, One thing that wasn't mentioned uh, before, which kind of where the problems kind of get introduced, especially in the previous uh, case, was that there was discovered DNA samples that were previously thought to be missing. There was a total of 199 samples that were found in the freezer of the institution in which these were being held. So this means that testing these samples would reveal that there's actually no indication that these victims, the victims that he had been previously accused of killing, were done by two people. So just keep this information in mind as we move forward to the next part. Uh, And the reason why this particular information wasn't public until uh, a certain point in time was because they didn't really bother to really investigate until he applied to have his case reopened. So the court trials had been informed of these two existing sets of DNA profiles from the case. And what was the most interesting about the profiles that, you know, they used in order to retest the DNA from the scenes was that, you know, we already know that the uh, the other assailant, uh, he was definitely the one doing (laughs) a lot of the. the horrible, heinous act. But come to find out the uh, DNA that they had matched to Christensen, uh, basically 54% of the male population, the Norwegian population actually had matched that DNA sample, meaning it just so happened he was included in the batch of people who matched that DNA sample, which means it was a very vague sample, which could have came from anywhere. And it wasn't necessarily a smoking gun regarding Viggo Christensen himself. So the only person that they got a confirmed match was Anderson, who was the other person who uh, was with him. And they assumed he committed the crime with. Now, based on the decision from the Criminal Cases Review Commission, Christensen's attorney requested that he be released from prison. So previously, Christensen had declined to apply for parole as he considered that as like an acknowledgement of guilt, which I can somewhat respect that, you know, because, you know, you don't want to admit to something you didn't do. Uh, But however, what's interesting about this as well is that both the prison authority and the Court of Appeals rejected his request a couple times. And uh, basically, the legal team that he had hired or was on his side appealed the decision to the Supreme Court just so they can hear the, uh, the, the case. And the state prosecutor responsible for the case chose to withdraw objections from Christensen's release, which means ultimately he was able to uh, kind of be released approximately, what was it, around 11 p.m., uh, I believe on June 1st. 
that that's when they unanimously decided that he was to be released immediately. Now, what's now some other information that we kind of discovered or kind of had to research was that on October 21st, 2022, the director of public prosecutions at the time represented the highest prosecuting authority in Norway issued a huge apology because this was a huge miscarriage of justice, acknowledging what had happened and acknowledging that there were a lot of questionable techniques that were used in order to get him to either confess or basically completely ignoring and not submitting chunks of evidence that could have probably exonerated him but they were so hung on what he had done in his past they wanted him to be guilty and nonetheless they had to apologize for those mistakes now because of these developments in october 2022 uh basically there was a huge order of comprehensive fact-finding inquiries into the institutions that had been involved in the case, meaning they had to get investigated to see what was wrong, why didn't certain things come to light until the appeal, and additionally, the Ministry of Justice initiated the process of establishing a mandate for fact-finding inquiries, signifying that they're committed to actually uncovering the truth and addressing all the shortcomings, especially regarding this particular case. Now, one thing that I want you guys to hear, this is going to be a part of like, you know, uh, kind of uh, what happened during the initial interrogation of Anderson. The police applied very suggestive questioning techniques. And we did mention this in the last episode as well, how their techniques were a little weird, but ultimately they withdrew information uh, from the public, which is why at the end of it, uh, me in particular, because Delilah did say, you know, she kind of believed in Christensen. <laughs> so, but me and myself, you know, I was just reading it as a fact, but it seemed like he was very much guilty because they withheld information. But the lead interrogator, without any formal training, proceeded with this so called informal conversations with Anderson while waiting for his attorney, uh, waiting for Anderson's attorney to arrive. Uh, so during the time, the interrogator informed Anderson that the police knew that there was more than one perpetrator and also introduced Anderson to the idea that Christensen was a participant, even though the leading uh, like the leading gun for even that information wasn't even true at the time. So basically using suggestive words, they tricked Anderson, the perpetrator who actually committed the, the, the actual crime into kind of wheeling Christensen into this and uh, I'm just going to give a little piece of what was said uh, during the uh, basically what, the, what what was reported to have been said during the questioning. So this is from the perspective of the police report and the cop who wrote it. I explained to Anderson that the police now knew he was one of the perpetrators. I also told Anderson that the advantages he would get by explaining everything I asked Anderson if he himself could be a victim in some sense, since his best buddy Viggo Christensen could have been the most active participant. When I said this, it was obvious that Anderson got something to think about. We talked a little bit back and forth about the relationship between Anderson and Christensen, and there was no doubt that Christensen was the strong one, the one in charge. So as we've kind of mentioned throughout several different podcast episodes, there's a lot of questionable behavior that can happen during an interrogation, which is why I say this to you. I say this to everybody. I, I tell people I preach this, you know, especially after the things I've learned in school, no matter how nerve wracking it may be, do not say anything without your uh, attorney or legal representation there because they will attempt to, you know, unfortunately, suggestively lead you on to either admit to something or admit that someone else was involved or, you know, what, whatever the case may be, uh, this unfortunately does happen. And this happened with Christian uh, Christensen. So even though he actually had a past of, you know, having some difficulty childhood, uh, difficult childhood with his behavior and kind of, you know, whatever he was dealing with when he was younger, nonetheless, he was still innocent of this crime. But because of the police officers, because of their suggestive, you know, uh, as I would say, interrogative techniques, and I say that in air, uh, air quotes, uh, unfortunately, he was convicted of something that he did not do. And uh, it seems as well, because they were withholding DNA evidence, it wasn't properly tested, it, it wasn't properly investigated, 
they also just use very surface level information to prove their point even though as we found out the sample that they used to test against Vigo was indeed a match for more than half of the Norwegian population, which means it would have matched for anyone, damn near. So uh, it's really messed up. So this is the update. You know, this is kind of me running through the information and, uh, you know, uh, just kind of explaining how these events transpired into what they are today. So you can go ahead, Delilah, and kind of talk about your take on this. Okay, guys, I just want to say one thing. I believed in Christensen since day one, okay? I believed that he was either innocent or that he was, like, didn't really want to do it, but helped him out because they did say that it could be two people because it would be too hard to, like, assault and do everything, the whole act with only one person. Right. So I thought he kind of like was part of it, but he didn't really do anything. That's what I believe. And then when all the other evidence came and then they still kind of like, they started bringing up his history. uh, I was like, oh no, I felt betrayed because I thought that he actually did not commit anything prior. And usually there is when you have committed something in the past it could you know happen again so then i just ended up believing in the police reports and stuff and i just like oh yeah he did it and i was very emotional i can agree with you on that one um and he also asked uh we stated on the benahaya part two episode that he was regretful for what he did when he was 14 to 17 year old but even though i mean it's good that he regrets what he did it means that he has a conscience and that he have a chance to change and not redo the act again but he still committed the crime he still molested that or those children and they still will have the trauma and also fear for the rest of their lives that they have to deal with and i still feel very strongly that that's not good criticism <laughs> i'm still mad about that however uh but this update it's very clear that criticism was not involved which is really good uh that he is not and also that they the police department or not only the police department but like all, everyone involved in the case apologized for it because it was you know it, it was their fault kind of because you know they 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 did the wrong techniques for interrogation we have also talked about that in previous cases that it's very important to be uh ob- like objective and not be biased in any way or hinting or anything uh which happened in this case and uh you know which also unfortunately made Chris's on be part of the whole story and everything so i'm glad that he is uh free and that they uh made the right thing in the end i guess that's about it what i have with that uh i don't i think it's good that the uh law enforcement but also the police department investigate everything that they learned and grew from this and that they could admit that they did a, a faulty thing um, well, and I would, mm-hmm. I would, I would say, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure not everyone apologized. I mean, it took 10 years, but still, yeah, but, uh, <laughs> they, I'm pretty sure not everyone they, apologized, but I know before you had mentioned that, uh, like you had mentioned something about Anderson getting like a lesser charge because he didn't have a previous record, which, um, even though they didn't specifically state that, uh, I know that I'm pretty sure that was probably the case. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And how he was playing the victim now the thing is they we we talked about this in both parts that they had lower than average iqs which means they were definitely taken advantage of by the police they you know the the tactic was used to turn them against each other and you know the the psychoanalyst knew when they gave him that diagnosis of you know kind of being below average and i guess 
my question or well i say question to you but also question to the audience you know you can answer this you know either by responding to social media or in the comments or well basically the ways that you've already been responding which is on facebook post or whatever um how do you feel about like let, so we found out christensen is innocent right he he was acquitted mm -hmm. uh he was vindicated you know he kept fighting and saying like hey i wasn't involved he kept you know making his point i didn't do it the, so should that mean that anderson should get more time or and or does that mean a retrial the police, yeah, should he get a retrial like you know anything along those lines and or should the police not only be investigated but should they be charged um, for what they did because during the time, remember this happened like 10 years ago when even though those techniques were being used at the time, I'm almost confident at least a couple of those officers are still on the force who were involved, um, at least. So they're, like, do you think there should be uh, something done more than simply just him being acquitted because it's not just simply a mistake this was outright negligence yeah. in the highest. They had DNA evidence. They had the evidence for and 10 they years. they did nothing and, yeah. with it. So do you feel they like this should, this should be done, uh, something should be done more? I think that, you know, it's actually quite like hard because usually if you work in this kind of job where it can affect a person for the rest of their lives, I think they have a lot of insurances and stuff, which makes it like impossible to, um, you know, get charged for something for doing your job or what you thought would be your job. Um, so even if you would, I mean, you could complain, you can make a complaint like, hey, that's not fair. And then maybe you can get some money from it, but um, you can't really put the interrogator in jail for doing their jobs <clears throat> but um i mean th then it has to really be very faulty if like maybe the police and oh the interrogator was like i don't know a uh, history of doing the same thing over and over again uh with intent and everything then maybe yes but that's even even that is quite hard to do um, but in this case, for example, it seems like the interrogator at that time did not have a lot of training and stuff. Um, and not new at his job, but like that he had, didn't have an official training to interrogate. And, um, you know, to see this type of interrogator, interrogator m techniques and methods is something that was very common in the 80s. So to see this again in a newer age and modern age is quite shocking. And I think it should probably be investigated upon, but I don't think nothing is going to happen. Uh, that's at least what I think about it. Um, however, with the Anderson case, um, I think that if you don't have anything prior, uh, you automatically get a lesser charge but I don't know if he got a lesser charge because he kind of blamed everything on Christensen. So, I mean, he, it could have been a both situation, but I would have liked him to have a, because he lied, obviously, in court, and they have proof of it now because Christensen is free. So he could, you know, like, if somebody wants to open a retrial, uh, he could get more. Well, I think, uh, in, like I said, in his case, I don't think it's entirely his fault. Uh, like I said, because he was already lower than Ar Anderson. Or Anderson. You mean... Like, he obviously okay, yeah. did it. But I think the issue is that, like like I said before, like we've said before, lower IQ, he was manipulated. They use suggestive tactics. Mm. But I guess what if i were to answer my own question i would expect not only investigation but ultimately i would expect them to reevaluate the cases of the anything that the interrogator had worked on including the detectives who were involved because this is a cohesive uh group effort it wasn't like you know it was one single cop who believed this no this is something that needs to be because that's that's what happens sometimes over here in the states if someone gets acquitted for a crime that they didn't commit 
And it's one thing if legitimately you did your job right, but then due to technology, they just simply couldn't uh, find the answers. That's one situation. But then if you had the information, you had the DNA evidence, you were using suggestive techniques, and then you didn't properly and fully investigate a crime, you actually will get investigated by, well, let's say if it was like any kind of, I'm just using NYPD for an example, uh, Mm -hmm. then you get investigated by IAB, and then, which is, you know, internal affairs, you know, the IA, whatever. And then... Mm -hmm they would actually have to reopen your case, uh, your case files, you know, within a certain time frame to see if there's a possibility of that behavior affecting other cases. That's the reason why uh, when, you know, IAB investigates your, you know, you. Yeah, I think they, they, I will say that I think they probably have that. Yeah, I was was just speaking. I'm not sure. I was just speaking for myself. Mm. Like, I would want that. I don't, they didn't mention it. So I, I can't, I don't know if they're going to do that, but usually i know over here if they find out you've done stuff like this and you had evidence they would have to investigate your entire caseload backlogged reopen cases Mm -hmm. and sometimes that means certain people would have to get acquittals or their their file sealed all because of something fishy you did and sometimes even if you got the right person in some of your cases because you made a mistake chances are they they're going to get let go because of something you did that was funky in Prior another case it, yeah. so that's why a lot of the times even though they you know want it's it's kind of contradictory in a lot of ways in the, in the, in the culture but that's that's just part of my point i'm not going to get into the whole other part but that's what i think should happen but uh i mean besides these updates uh, i mean it's We've kind of went over pretty much all the parts of the case that were updated already in terms of why he was convicted, kind of how things transpired. So if you're watching or I said watching, but if you're listening to this podcast and, uh, you know, you're you're somewhat confused, go back and watch the Manaheim murders part one and two. And you can kind of understand where we're coming from with this so you can get all the primary information. And then this update is a secondary information building on what happened after the fact. And, uh, mm. you know, once again, we appreciate the podcasters, uh, podcast listeners who basically, you know, was typing, letting us know like what's going alert. on. And they were very and alert tell, yeah. because uh, that is something we preach. That's really good. We preach it in our podcast is that, you know, no matter what we, even we say, go do your research, stay up to date on these 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 cases these trials and we actually like move this episode forward just to talk about this because enough people brought it to our attention and i guess i felt like it would be best to talk about it now rather than later so uh yeah you know and also we might do this like these things like updated um episodes as well uh, in the future because some of the cases that we do are still like ongoing. very yeah ongoing and some of them are even like very new and uh, you know anything can happen so um, I mean it's really good of you if you guys just tell us like oh this is an update here and that we can like do uh, some type of episode with an updated version um, so we very we appreciate that you guys are doing this it's it's helping us a lot and it's also good for you guys that you are researching it's really good um so yeah so um i hope you enjoy today's oh i just want to say one thing before we end i just want to say one thing okay if you if you listener over there have not heard the case of benahea i i i will be emotional (laughs) i will be emotional at the second part okay and that's because i cannot stand kids um i i I, it hurts for me to see kids who are innocent being hurt and violated and it gets me emotional and it also was very emotional for me due to chris i truly believe chrisson did not do anything prior which he did and it just made me very very emotional so yeah so i hope you enjoyed today's episode uh you know it's pretty much an update we'll 
do this more frequently uh i guess for season two since you guys like uh i guess being kept up to date on these and uh i guess it's i mean it's still an episode so i guess why not talk about you know some food to end it off on a good note uh even though this was technically a good ending for an episode you know someone was proven innocent and was acquitted so it already was on a good note but i guess we can put a little icing on the cake and uh i don't know since i said cake icing on a cake let's go for dessert uh i can definitely go for pineapple upside down cake that sounds great right now i want chia pudding i don't know what that is but it sounds mid oh it's like seeds with with like milk or oat milk whatever you want to use yeah, and they put a little yeah. sugar in it and it becomes a pudding yeah i don't think i'll be into that but you know yeah, if, i know if, don't. if you enjoy it go ahead you know what no judgment here but uh hopefully you know we'll you see judging. you guys we'll see you guys next time and uh peace out <laughs> bye, bye.